chapter 6 manufacturing industries so in this chapter we will purely speak about industries that prepares things that manufacture things now always remember manufacturing is associated with secondary activity we have heard about all the different sorts of activities like the primary secondary tertiary and quaternary so the secondary sector of the economy deals with the finished good these are sometimes also called as production sector because they transform raw materials into products or goods. So I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. Now here's a fine definition about manufacturing. Production of goods in large quantities after processing from raw materials to more valuable products is called manufacturing. So just a quick example to understand this term in a more better manner. So iron ores are found in rock particles. So you have to extract these ores from these rock particles only then you can have the purest iron ores like hematite or magnetite. And after that, hematite and magnetite is turned into a piece of iron that can be used. So the job of the iron and steel industry is to convert those raw material, those rocks, into iron bars. So now imagine this, if there were no manufacturing industries, you cannot pick those rock, you cannot directly sell it to the public, right? So what you need to do is you need to process those raw material, right? So that a valuable product like iron or steel, which is which has more value in the market, that can be produced out of that raw material and sold to the public. So I hope the definition of manufacturing is crystal clear. So like that we have many more examples. Paper is manufactured from wood, sugar is from sugar cane, iron and steel is from iron ore and aluminium is from bauxite. So all these materials that have market value, they all come out of ores or some kind of raw material. Now this is an interesting line. The economic strength of a country is measured by the development of manufacturing industries. This is absolutely true because at the end of the day, you need to make things in your own house in order to earn profit. You cannot always depend on importing things. Well, you can import things if you have a lot of money. But then things in the international market has value and those values go up and down every now and then and more often it goes up. So with rising cost it is always better to manufacture things at your own home place. And you also need to see it from other perspectives such as if you have a manufacturing hub in your own hometown then that particular place is going to get a lot of employment out of it. People are going to get a lot of jobs which is really good for the economy. So I hope you understand the chain reaction. So now we are going to read about the importance of manufacturing. So we know that manufacturing sector is the backbone of any nation's economy. So let's quickly go through the points that justifies the importance of manufacturing sector. So the first one is manufacturing industries reduce the heavy dependence of people on agricultural income by providing them jobs in secondary and tertiary sectors. So India is an agrarian country which means more than 60% of its population is engaged in agricultural activity. Now, with a nation as large as India, we need to divide the working force of the nation in a very efficient manner. So to do that, manufacturing industries are the best example because they produce things. And when you produce things in a nation, the development automatically boosts up. So in order to move people from primary sector to secondary or tertiary sector, manufacturing plays an important role. And the second point is industrial development is a precondition for eradication of unemployment and poverty from a country. As I said, industrial development means producing or manufacturing goods at your own home country. And when there is an industrial boost in a nation, automatically the unemployment level will go down because so many people will be needed to work in a factory or an industry. And this is also the philosophy behind public sector industries and joint sector ventures in India. So public sector industries are those industries which are solely owned by the government. They are the sole owners. They run it. There is no private intervention. And industries do develop a particular portion of the geographical area of a nation. Because just think of it this way. If there is an industry that has to be set up at place A, then chances are more and more people from that region of place A will be employed in that industry. Hence, that's going to increase the socio-economic condition of that place. So I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. Now the third point is, export of manufactured goods expand trade and commerce and brings in much needed foreign exchange. Now as I said, if we do not produce our own goods in our home country, now we will have to be dependent on foreign imports and that will drain the nation's economy. And similarly, in the opposite sense, if we increase the manufacturing industry of in our nation, or in other words, if we increase the production of goods in our own country, then we will have something to sell to everyone. 
By everyone, I mean different countries. Hence, that will expand trade and commerce. Because there will be so many countries lined up to buy products from us. And that's going to bring in the foreign exchange. And the last point is, countries that transform their raw materials into a wide variety of furnished goods of higher value are prosperous. Now, this is a very, very important point. So, the whole point of industries are to convert raw material into something valuable. Because if there is no value in that raw material, then nobody is going to buy in the market. That's why you see so many new products coming up in the market. Because if you can produce something better and better every time, the value automatically goes up. And if the value goes up, then that's a success. That is going to actually make the market richer. And people are going to actually spend. And if people spend more, then the money is going to be in the rotation and the economy will prosper. So, these are some of the points that supports the importance of manufacturing. Now, agriculture and industry are both interdependent on each other. Because if you see, the agricultural industry has to be dependent on manufacturing industries for irrigation pumps, fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, plastics and pipes, machines, tools, etc. So I hope you understand the interdependence. Similarly, if there is no agriculture, then there will be no food manufacturing industries. Because a lot of the food around us you see are packaged. So for that we need an industry. But primarily the food will come from the agricultural sector. So this is what is the meaning when they say that both the industry have to move hand in hand. Now we will read about the contribution of industry to national economy. So if you read the economic survey of India, in that you will find sectorial divisions of various sectors that together adds up to Indian GDP. As I have said before that agricultural sector, manufacturing sector and service sector together they make up the GDP of a nation. Since this chapter is entirely about manufacturing industries, so we will be focusing on the manufacturing industry part. So what you will find in the economic survey is that the manufacturing sector has been stagnated, which means there has been no significant growth. Well, let me just pull up the recent data and show you what I mean. So as per the 2016 economic survey, the Indian economy is estimated to grow at 7.6% and the growth in industry sector is estimated to be at 7.3%. So if you see now the manufacturing is once again growing. The NCRT book is almost a decade old. So 10 years back the manufacturing sector was stagnant. There was not much of rapid growth. And the reason behind that was that the government did not make any appropriate policy interventions. And there was not much efforts which was put behind the industry's overall productivity. Because now if you see the Indian government has taken several initiatives to boost up the manufacturing sector. So one such initiative is the Make in India initiative. Wherein steps have been taken by the recent BJP government to boost manufacturing sector. People can devote their effort, resources and energy in productive work. And government has also allocated certain budget in the form of investment by giving loans to the startups or the small scale medium enterprises. So these all efforts have been made by the government to boost the manufacturing sector. Now we will read about the industrial location. So they are basically influenced by certain factors and they are the availability of raw materials, labor, capital, power and market. And if you find all of these things at one place, then you will have an ideal location to set up your own industry. And if you don't have all these things at one place, then you can make it available or it can be arranged at a lower cost. And that is where cost cutting planning comes into play. And this is a known fact that after an industrial activity starts, the urbanization follows. And the reason is simply because of employment. If there is a factory that has to be set up at place A, mostly the people who reside at that place will get maximum job opportunity and their houses will also be closer to the place of work. And these are some solid reasons behind that. And it is absolutely true that industrialization and urbanization go hand in hand. That's because urbanization is nothing but people. And if there are no people, then industries will not function. Now, sometimes a business has to rely on another business. Because to run an industry, there are many services that needs to be taken care of. So cities provide services such as banking, insurance, transport, labor, consultants, financial advisors, etc. Now this term agglomeration economies means everyone coming together to make a certain thing happen. So if the urban society and the industry comes together, then both of them will benefit out of each other. And seconds back we just read 
how it can happen. So this joint venture sort of thing is known as agglomeration economies. And if you see traditionally, that is pre-independence period, at that time manufacturing units were located at places which were close to the sea. Because seaways was the perfect way for trading to other places. In fact, the British and other European trade companies came to India through seaport. Now let's quickly understand this figure, which tells us what is the industry market linkage. So to set up an industry, we need all these inputs. Okay, the raw materials, then labor, capital, infrastructure, etc. And all of these inputs have to be transported to factory. So this one over here is a brick and mortar place. And then from the factory comes the output, meaning what is the product that has been produced. And then that product goes to the market, where people buy that product by paying a certain amount, so that the industry again restarts the production of that product. So now we are going to read about the classification of industries. So industries are classified based on the raw material that they use. I repeat, based on the raw material that they use. So that's how we have agro-based industry and mineral-based industry. So if you see some example of agro-based, they are cotton, woolen, jute, silk, textile, rubber, sugar, tea, coffee, and edible oil. So if you see all of these things are extracted from agricultural produce. So that's why they have been finally defined under agro-based industries. And the second one is mineral-based industry. So in this we are talking about minerals of iron, steel, cement, aluminium, machines, tools, petrochemicals. So that's why they have been again nicely tagged under mineral-based industries. So another form of classification is done based on their main role. So when we say main role, we mean what is their area of expertise. Because we know the main role of iron and steel industries. Their work is just to produce iron bars and steel and metal frames. So, and then we have consumer industries, so which are purely dedicated in making things which are used by consumers. You can also say things that we use in our day-to-day -day life in a household. And another form of classification is based on capital investment. So when we are talking about capital, we are talking about the money that is involved. Now, if you, if you have a large industry, it will have more capital. If you have a small scale industry, it will have less capital. So in that sense, we go on to divide industry based on capital investment. And then we have classification on industries based on the ownership. And I think this is the most important one because you need to be familiar about which industry is owned by who, because that's how the importance of the industry is determined. For example, we have uh, public sector industries. So these are purely owned and operated by the government agencies. So some of the examples are Bail Bharat Heavy Electronics Limited, then uh, SAIL, which stands for Steel Authority of India Limited. And likewise, we have Gale, that is Gas Authority of India Limited. So like that, we have public sector industries. And the second one is private sector industries. So by the term private, you can pretty much figure out that these are owned and operated by individuals or a group of individuals. So some of the examples are Tisco, then Bajaj Auto Limited, then we have Tata Steel, then Dabur Industries. All these things fall under private sector industries. And the third one is joint sector industries. So by the word joint, you can easily figure out that it has to be a combination of two things. So here the two things are, one is the private sector, another one is the public sector. So both of them come into some kind of a joint venture partnership to run a joint sector industry. And again, some of the example of joint venture industries are Oil India Limited. And the last one is the cooperative sector industries. So by the term cooperative, it basically means that these kind of industries are owned and operated by the producers or suppliers of raw material, workers or both. So one good example that I can give you to make you understand this better is, so suppose you have a big company and you require people to clean that place. So you cannot hire a bunch of people who will just clean the entire place, right? You will go and talk to a consultancy which provides manpower for cleaning purpose. So the agency that provides um, manpower for the cleaning service, that will get into some kind of a business agreement with you. So here two businesses are getting into agreement and that is what is the meaning of cooperative sector, wherein two parties are actually cooperating with each other and helping the problems. And the last form of classification of industries is based on the weight or bulk of raw material or the finished good that they produce. So under this we have heavy industries such as iron and steel industries. And because iron and steel are the backbone of any nation's economy, that's why they fall under the heavy industry because they do some heavy duty work. 
and then we have the light industries. So here the raw materials that are used are of light in nature and the produced good is also not that heavy. It's, it's light uh, such as the electrical industries which which consists of wires and fuses, bulbs, lights, all these things are very light output compared to machineries or, or big tools that we produce under heavy industries. So anyways, I hope you get the entire picture of uh, classification of industries, how industries are classified in India. So now comes the part where I have to elaborate on individual industries. So what I have planned is I'm going to make a separate short video on this section. As it is, I don't want this video to go any more longer so that you lose interest. I'll update the links and activate the info card when I make that video. So let's move on to the next topic. So the next topic is industrial pollution and environmental degradation. While the industries contribute significantly to the India's economic growth and development, but it also increases the pollution in terms of land, water, air, noise and sometimes they degrade the environment to a highest limit. So basically industries are responsible for four types of problems and they're always related to air, water, land and noise. So let's quickly go through each one of them in brief. Now air pollution is always due to high proportion of undesirable gas. We're talking about sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide. So these are some gases that we do not want in the air but they are somehow there. Then you'll find smokes coming out of chemical and paper factories then brick kilns, refineries and smelting plants, then burning of fossil fuels. So all of these things add to the air pollution. A lot of the times factories ignore pollution norms which are set by the government. Nobody follows that. They just keep on doing their business as usual every single day. So air pollution affects human health, animals, plants, buildings and atmosphere as a whole. So this was all about the air pollution part. Now the second one is water pollution. Now water pollution means throwing organic and inorganic industrial wastes and affluents into the rivers. So the things like paper, pulp, chemical, textiles, dyeing, petroleum refineries, tanneries, electroplating industries. So they let out their detergents, acids, salts and everything into the river. Now as a result, the water gets polluted, poisonous and that affects the water organisms, fishes die and since rivers are the lifeline of the nation, if you go on to poison the lifeline, then it is going to get difficult to survive. So all these things just keep on happening every now and then. The next one is thermal pollution. Now when we say thermal, we are talking about heat. So thermal plants, they generate electricity. So what they do is, uh, with the help of fossil fuel, they turn water into steam and those steams are used to uh, turn the turbine in order to generate electricity. So as you know, we need lots of hot water. So what do you do with the hot water? You then drain it into the river and ponds before cooling. And that's what the thermal factories are doing. And that's dangerous for the aquatic life. I mean, they're simply going to get burned. That's why you see waste from the nuclear plants, the nuclear and weapon production facilities. So they generate a lot of heat and usually the water is very hot. And what they do is they just release that hot water into the river. And then when people consume water from those river, they're born to diseases like cancer or birth defects and miscarriages. So this is something very serious. So you see soil and water pollution are closely related. I mean, all of these water pollutants, not only they cause diseases to the human beings, but, but it also degrades the soil of that region. I mean, making the soil useless. So you see how this pollution thing is causing two problems at a time. So by not giving enough good water to drink for the human beings and also degrading the soil so that there's no further cultivation that can be carried out. So there's two problems that you see in front of us with, with one pollution. And that is really very dangerous for a nation. And the next type of pollution is noise pollution. So the problem that you will face with noise pollution is that you'll get irritated or you'll get angry. So continuously hearing something can cause hearing impairment and it also causes a increase in heart rate and blood pressure. So if you see these are some really serious physiological effects. I mean you can imagine if there is a house construction that is going on nearby your place. So the kind of noise that they make while cutting the iron rod or you know doing some kind of carpentry work. So the noise of the drilling machine and the chainsaw they make so much of noise that it can really make you go nuts. And you may not notice it but slowly you will tend to get irritated. And these are something really serious when it comes to health. So these were some of the pollutions that are caused by the industries. And the last topic of this chapter is control of environmental degradation. Now we know that how industries are important for a nation's economy and we also know the kind of pollution and the level of pollution that these industries causes. 
Now, does it mean that we totally shut down these industries? The answer is no, that, that cannot happen 100%, right? I mean, we can reduce the degradation and I think we must. It's one of those situations where you cannot do anything about it. I mean, you know that the thing on the left side is important and you also know that the thing on the right side is getting disturbed due to the left side. So you cannot create any sort of a wall in between. So all you can do is you can just balance both the things. So how do we do that? So we can minimize the use of water for processing by reusing or recycling it. So if you remember a few minutes back, we spoke that how in thermal uh, power plant, they use the hot water and they directly dump it into the uh, river without cooling it down. So what they can do is they can create another a big restoration tank sort of a thing wherein you can dump all the hot water and you cool them up with time or with some kind of a chemical or you know with nitrogen oxide or whatever it is and then maybe you can reuse the water in some or the other way and I think these things are happening in many of the big hotels and um, multinational companies so I remember going to one place where they have been recycling the toilet water the good water that we used to clean a face and hand so when that water becomes dirty they treat that water with some chemical and they utilize that same treated water for flushing out toilets so if you see that's a really good thing so the second thing is rainwater harvesting so again in India we have water from three sides but then we still face water scarcity therefore to meet the water requirement it is very important that we learn to harvest the rainwater I mean if you know this or not but during monsoon the state of Kerala and Meghalaya receives the heaviest rainfall yet there are many villages and places in these two states which do not have water to drink for the rest of the year so just imagine how much of rainwater harvesting is important and the third point is treating hot water or affluents before releasing them in the river just moments back what I was speaking about is this so you take the water you treat it with some mechanical means and you know you just treat it with some biological process and then again reuse it for some uh, purpose now the groundwater is very important because it is one of the sources of fresh water so overdrawing it can reduce the level of groundwater and if you see industries and factories usually do that so I think what government needs to do is they need to regulate this you know by setting a limit so that for example if there's a law saying that um, say 1500 or 2000 liter of water can only be drawn in one day so what I'm trying to say is that this all things cannot stop the problem completely but it can reduce the problem to a certain extent. I mean like it or not you guys know this in India if you need to get anything done you have to impose some legal rule on it otherwise no one is going to follow it and that is the reason almost everything has been regulated by the government. So basically it's all about regulating and creating appropriate laws and I think sometimes innovation also works for example machineries and equipments can be redesigned so that they are energy efficient and they reduce noise so that's why you see a lot of the electronic products these days in the market they come with those four star rating sometimes five star rating so these stars indicate that these are energy efficient products so these are some of the ways that can help in reducing the pollutions and environment degradation so with this, we have come to an end of this chapter. I hope you found this video informative. Anything that you don't understand, feel free to reach out. As usual, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoy these videos and see a purpose behind watching them, please like the video and comment down below. Until then, catch you guys later and talk to you guys on the next one. Peace.